Thank you to the organizers uh, for having us on board for this colloquium for the last year uh, and uh, provided us with a lot of feedback, uh, which really helped the project. Uh, so thanks a lot for that. Um, so this is, uh, in a sense, quite complementary to the previous paper in the sense that we're not going to look at inflation. We're going to look at real output. Um, we don't have non-homothetic preferences. We will have homothetic preferences. But we do have uh, input-output linkages in, in our setup. So I'm not sure if it's as good as the previous paper, but at least uh, maybe we can talk to some of the questions that have been asked uh, right now. And so this is joint work with uh, Bastien Bernon uh, from uh, ULB as well, PhD student, and Hube Konings, who is in KU Leuven, and uh, Nazarbayev. They're both here, so feel free to interact uh, afterwards. Okay, so the starting point of this um, thought experiment in the beginning was actually that on top of a massive health crisis globally, COVID-19 has affected uh, real output, so both firms and households, in a sense that firms were shut down uh, during the first lockdowns and or had reduced uh, uh, activities, um, which also led to temporary employment schemes because people were uh, put on furlough schemes uh, or temporary contracts which, were not got, uh, which did not get uh, renewed or people were going to work uh, less to take care of the kids at home, et cetera. Um, and of course, this leads to large changes in welfare, right? So people are going to work less, so in nominal terms, uh, they might have lower wages, uh, or they have, they're going to be forced to move across sectors uh, in response to being laid off in, in a less, less attractive sector, which is going to lower their wages as well. Uh, and of course, this has an impact on the whole output of the economy. And in this paper, we would like to ask the question, what's going to happen to labor quantities, wages, and real output in response to two things? And we're going to look at uh, two exercises uh, right now. One is what happens if there's going to be a labor-specific productivity shock in one sector? How is it going to affect wages in this particular sector, but also in all other sectors due to the input-output structure of the network? Um, and this will, going to, this will affect labor quantities, wages, and, and, and output. And then we're going to do a second exercise, which is uh, people are going to be per imperfectly mobile across sectors, so there are going to be labor frictions in our model. What happens if we're going to uh, reduce labor frictions, for instance, and this might be due to education or labor market policies, uh, in a sense, what's going to happen to, to those quantities as well? Okay, so... Um, a helicopter view of the, of the model. So uh, households are going to be consumers, but they're also going to be workers in production. And on the consumption side, they have uh, identical homothetic preferences, which is, so real GDP, Y, is going to be given by a homothetic aggregator, D, which is kind of aggregating over all consumption uh, goods in the economy. And consumption goods are going to be indexed by I, which is also the sector, right? So one good, one sector in this case. On the production side, um, there are n sectors um, with constant returns to scale, and output of uh, sector I is going to be given by combining labor, Li, with a bunch of intermediate inputs, Xij, and we're going to be focusing on what happens to uh, output and to all the uh, outcomes of interest if we're going to shock uh, Zil, which is actually labor-specific productivity, okay? Um, workers are going to, so households are also going to work, and they're going to supply their labor in particular sectors based on two components. They have some preferences for a particular sector, and this is like a reduced form way of thinking about their education or talent that really fits well with this particular sector, and the wages. So I'm going to work in sector I, the higher my preference uh, phi I is for this sector, and the higher the wages are going to be, WI relative to the average wages and my preferences with respect to the rest of the economy. And in this case, there are going to be imperfect mobility, which is going to be parametrized by kappa. And um, so in a model, and also when we're going to take the data, we're going to have some, some, some value for this kappa, but it's instructive to look at two extreme cases. One is there's perfect immobility. Kappa is equal to zero, all the wage differentials drop out, and everything is going to be driven by my preferences, uh, phi i, okay? So I'm going to work in a sector which I'm very happy to work in. In the other extreme, there's perfect mobility, the preference component is going to drop out, and everything is going to be driven by uh, relative wages, 
And in the standard general equilibrium model with perfect mobility, these wages are going to be equal to one wage in the, in the whole economy. Okay? So and in between, we might have uh, labor frictions and also wage differentials because of this uh, imperfect mobility. On the output side, so how big is a particular sector I? It's given by lambda I, which is actually the sales over GDP, which is the domar weight, as, as they call it. And this domar weight is given by how important this sector is in production to final consumption, omega C, or as its input supplier to other sectors in the economy that themselves directly or indirectly su uh, support or sell to uh, final demand. Okay? And so the whole network structure of the economy is actually captured in this uh, uh, Psi Ji, which is capturing how important sector I is in producing stuff up to final demand. Okay? On the right-hand side, the big lambda I is the share of value added of the economy that's going to workers. Okay? And how big is this thing? It's given by the sales uh, share of, uh, of the sector, so the output. The bigger the output is, the more value added is going to that sector, times how many people are going to be uh, allocated to the sector in terms of work. Okay? So, and given this information, we are able to kind of back out all the, all the information in terms of shocks later on. In particular, we're interested in the following exercise. What's going to happen to wages in the sector I given this productivity shock to labor in sector S? So intuitively, if I'm going to have a productivity shock in one sector, this is going to affect wages in the same sector. But because sectors are also connected to the input-output structure of the economy, those productivity shocks might not only affect the wages in the own sector, but also in other sectors, okay? And how does this look like we can decompose it into three components. One is what we call a labor centrality channel, which is saying in response to this particular shock, how is the value added share of this uh, sector going to change, or the value added share of all that uh, given sectors. And this component is really going to capture the input output structure of, uh, of the economy, okay? The second component is saying, okay, in response to this productivity shock, what's going to happen to the amount of labor in the same sector and other sectors as well, okay? And then the third component, this, this productivity shock, and that's the most intuitive component, the productivity shock will have uh, an impact on GDP, right? I might have an increase in productivity, so this should affect my real output at the economy level. All right? So the first result is, is an inequality neutral result, and that's where we got stuck the first two months. Um, but the idea is that if you have local linear models, so you have a cop Douglas production, cop Douglas consumption, either as an exact function of the economy or as a first order approximation of something that you have in mind, there's no inequality result. Everything is going to be driven by this change in GDP, right? So there might be that in response to a shock, wages in all sectors are going to adjust, but they're going to move perfectly in tandem such that there's no inequality result, okay? However, once you go to more flexible setups, the two other components are going to open up and that's where you get these inequality results from. So we're interested in this exercise, like what's going, sorry, uh, back. We want to understand what's going to happen if we're going to induce a shock to wages and see how we can decompose that into those different uh, components. Um, so this is a non-parametric setup in the sense that this holds for, for many flexible uh, functional form assumption elasticities. Uh, once we want to take this to the data, we're going to uh, calibrate this and use Belgian data. We're going to impose a CES structure of production. And so the idea is that output of firm I or sector I is given by combining labor with its intermediate inputs. There's going to be some elasticity of substitution that allows people to substitute uh, between labor and also between intermediate inputs. And there's going to be a CES aggregator on the consumption side. Okay? And we're going to ask two questions. One is, what happens if there's a productivity shock? How are uh, wages, labor, and GDP going to change? And the other component is, let's say we have some kind of policy that allows us to reduce uh, uh, labor frictions across the board. How is it going to affect those outcomes as well? Okay, so a quick note on the data. So we're going to calibrate the model using Belgian I.O. tables, 64 sectors uh, for the year 2015, which is the latest year that we have available right now. That allows us to uh, put structure on, on, on the intermediate goods matrix, so we know how important every 
sector is in supplying another sector, given the whole input output structure, we can calculate the Leontief inverse elements, which allows us to calculate the lambdas that we're interested in. Uh, we know the labor and capital shares, which are the shares of value added in the economy. And we know how much people are being employed in terms of full-time equivalents in, uh, the, in every sector. So that's data. We're going to calibrate the model or the elasticities um, based on findings uh, from other papers. So sector elasticity of, of intermediate goods and factors is going to be a half. Uh, final demand elasticity is going to be 0.9. And it's important to state that, um, so this is really about complementarity. So this model or this, the way that we look at the data is about complementarities. If you have different values for the sigmas above one, then you will have substitutability. And a lot of the results that we're going to show, actually we're going to flip sign. Okay, but so the idea is we're going to pin down uh, those elasticities based on complementarities here. Um, the labor mobility uh, is going to be parameterized uh, due to a, uh, a paper by Simon Galle and, uh, and Lorentzen. And from that information, we can actually back out their worker preferences. So that's just one value that we get for every sector uh, uh, to, to, to finalize and, and, and complete the model. Okay, so first result. We're going to shock one sector in terms of labor productivity. Yeah, we picked energy. So forget about the impact of inflation and the current uh, energy crisis. This is just because energy is like an important supplier to other uh, sectors in the economy, okay? So that's a way to look at it. Um, so what's the impact on real GDP? It has, it can be split into a first order or a second order effect. And this is where most of the machinery of the algebra actually is, 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 is behind, but, but, uh, but this is the result. And so a shock to, the, uh, to labor productivity in the energy sector is going to generate a first order effect to GDP and a second order effect. The first order effect is saying a one increase in labor productivity in the energy sector is going to lead to a 0.005% increase in GDP. Is this a lot? Well, if you kind of do a back of the envelope calculation, uh, the energy sector is around 1% of uh, GDP. 50% of uh, value added is allocated to labor, so that's like 50% uh, labor share. If you do a 1% increase there, you roughly get actually that number. That's the first order effect. The second order effect is saying, okay, um, there's a concavity, right? So this is saying that the, sh the shock is not linear. If I'm going to move upwards, if I have a positive shock, I will have uh, uh, a positive effect, but this effect is going to be smaller than the effect of a negative shock, right? So uh, the second order effect is going to amplify negative shocks uh, and dampen positive shocks. And this is uh, kind of the intuition here, right? So the red line is the linear effect if you shock electricity uh, or, or the productivity of electricity, um, and then the blue line is taking account the, the total effect here, okay? So you see a positive shock gets dampened, the negative shock gets uh, uh, increased. What happens to all wages in the economy, right? So we shocked only this, the energy sector. We want to see what happens to wages in, in, in all the other sectors. So first, the mean wage elasticity, which was the left-hand side of the, of the counterfactual or comparative static that we were looking at, is saying how much is, going, how much is wage going to change in response to this uh, uh, productivity shock. And we see actually across the board, those changes are pretty small. Um, there's quite some uh, variance across sectors because some sectors might be very dependent on the electricity sector as an input. And so we can decompose this uh, into the, the three components, the, the, the labor centrality component, the, the labor quantity component, and the effect on, on real GDP. So we're going to shock uh, sector 35, which is the energy sector. Um, and the total effect on wages in all the other sectors are going to be given by the black dots. I'm not sure if you can see it, but so that's the total effect. And we're going to decompose that total effect into those three components. And you see indeed that um, the two main components, so, so the, GDP, the, 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 the GDP effect itself is, is close to zero, right? So that's, that was the one that we are thinking about as the most intuitive when we think about the productivity shock. But once you look at the labor productivity shock in terms of the uh, labor centrality components and the labor quantity components, actually they have offsetting uh, effects, right? Um, I'm happy to discuss uh, about the mechanisms uh, afterwards. 
if you have, uh, this, this is really based on complementarities. If you have substitutabilities, so, so sigma is larger than one, actually a lot of these things are going to flip uh, sign. Okay. Second exercise, uh, I'm not sure how much how I'm doing on time, but. Uh, okay, good, perfect. So um, second exercise, we're going to increase labor productivity, sorry, we're going to increase labor mobility across the board. Um, and we're going to see what's the impact on, on aggregate outputs, uh, wages, uh, uh, et cetera, again. Again, first order, second order effect. And we see that the first order effect of increasing kappa, this, this, the, the labor mobility, has a positive effect on, 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 uh, cross, uh, sorry, on, on real output. Um, and the idea is that if you're going to increase mobility, uh, the differential between wages is going to decrease, right? Because people are easier to, to, to move across sectors and because people are competing in those sectors, the, the wages are going to uh, converge towards the, the, the perfect mobility case. Um, and then there's a second order effect, again, because of its concavity, which will have a stronger impact on the negative side and a smaller impact on the positive side, okay? And so one finding here is that if you're going to reduce uh, labor frictions, across the board, this effect can be positive or negative on GDP. And the idea is that if people are going to move towards more productive or larger sectors of the economy, this has a positive impact on GDP. But if somehow they, they choose to go to smaller sectors, this might actually hurt aggregate outputs. Okay. So same kind of uh, uh, intuition as we just uh, discussed. Same kind of uh, dispersion of, uh, of the impact of a change in labor mobility on, on wages across the board. Um, yeah, so, so, there is, there is a change, so there's both positive and negative effects, I think. So there's a huge dispersion in terms of how wages are going to, to adjust. And uh, in this case, it turns out to be very important where you are. So if you calibrate this model based on the backed out labor uh, uh, labor uh, frictions uh, in the Belgian market, uh, we get this result, but it turns out if labor frictions are much higher or much lower, actually those results might, might change quite a lot. Okay, so this really depends on the structure of the economy uh, in the initial equilibrium. Same kind of exercise, uh, we're going to change uh, 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 labor mobility and we can decompose that effect across all sectors, right? So again, so this is taking into account both the direct effect on that sector, but also the whole uh, pass-through effect of, of, of going through the, the reallocation of, the, of, of production, uh, et cetera, in the, in the economy. Okay, so to conclude, we uh, want to show new source of, of, uh, of income inequality uh, in the sense that uh, sector wages might change in response to it productivity shock in the own sector, but also in response to productivity shocks to the other sectors. How much of that depends on the input-output structure of the economy and the amount of labor frictions which are in there. It's a super simple model in the sense it's perfect competition. Uh, we don't put a lot of uh, structure on that. Um, and uh, I, if you're going to extend the model with imperfect competition and, and richer demand sides, then of course you might have uh, knock-on effects. But I, the goal here was to look at what happens, what is the minimal that we need to, to generate those income inequality effects. Okay, so we have a model of income inequality which we're going to shock uh, labor productivity. We're going to see what happens if you're going to change labor frictions. Uh, and we see actually that one shock in one sector might have uh, uh, compound impacts on the own sector and also across the board uh, in terms of wages, labor supply, and aggregate output. In terms of policy implications, so, so we're not done yet with the paper yet, but I think uh, uh, one, one intuition here is that, let's say you have some sector-specific uh, 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 labor market policies, right? And uh, one, one, one danger in this case is that if you're going to impose those or you're going to implement those, those effects will not be restricted to the own sector but might have actually knock-on effects across all other sectors. And you really need to understand whether that's something that you want to do and how much, whether it's positive or negative, and how much really depends on the, on the structure of the network in this case. Um, and again, so increasing labor mobility might have positive or negative effects depending on where you are in initial equilibrium. And uh, so, so one way, reduced form way of thinking about this is like, uh, suppose we're going to 
increase uh, average education or if we're going to make uh, people on the job training, etc. sorry, easier to move across sectors uh, in response to the shock. So that's where we are right now. Thanks very much and looking forward to the discussion.